Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming out a little earlier today. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, uh, um, you know, be part of all the ideas, the creativity and, and collaboration that's gone on here the past few days, and I'm sure we'll continue today. Uh, dinner last night was great, and putting on an event like this is, is no small feat. So uh, uh, let's all thank the Transmart Foundation and University of Michigan for hosting and for their hospitality. I'd like to start today, if this thing works, it was working, yeah, <laughs> it's doing something, hold on a second, no, it's doing, yeah, oh, let's see if it works, <laughs> I'd like to talk about ants. Uh, as I drove here from the airport, I had on an NPR, and they were interviewing the famous biologist E.O. Wilson, who's known, as many of you know, I'm sure, for his pioneering work in the study of ants, uh, their social behavior, and, uh, and his studies made, uh, allowed some fascinating insights into the social structure, the reproductive biology, and uh, the natural selection of, of ants and ant colonies. Now, I'm not an expert compared to most of you, I'm sure, on natural selection, reproductive biology, uh, or ants, for that matter. Uh, I'm a tech geek, so, uh, so what does that have to do with what we're here to discuss today? Well, he put in the interview um, a very profound statement that stuck with me as relevant to what Transmart is doing and what we do at Open Clinica. Uh, to paraphrase, if you have two groups, one group is made up of individuals who act primarily in their own immediate self-interest, another group uh, that's oriented towards acting in more of an altruistic fashion for the good of the group, you get some interesting behavior. In the first group, as you might expect, the individuals that act most in their own self-interest tend to outperform other members of their group. But the second group, all else being equal, will always outperform the first group. This has been studied in, um, I guess I'll use this. This has been studied in economics as well. It's called governing dynamics. And when you have collaboration, sharing, and aligned incentives, which is what you get in the best of open source development and open source projects, then you can get exceptional leverage. As we know, this was uh, invented by the famous economist Russell Crowe. Uh, it's part of, the, part of the study of game theory. And uh, what I'm gonna try to do for the rest of the talk is connect ants, natural selection, and the ideas in governing dynamics to what we do here in Transmart uh, and illustrate that with some of my experience in the Open Clinica project. So, I'll start off with a little background on who we are at Open Clinica, what we do, uh, a little bit of the history, uh, talk about you know, why we ventured into the territory of open source and the life sciences, uh, some of the um, principles and practices that, that we try to adhere to and why we think they work well in this space. Uh, and then I'll go into a little more detail on, uh, you know, as we've been through this, what's worked really well from the start for us, you know, what didn't work so well or lessons we learned and adjustments we made along the way uh, that hopefully will be, will be useful for, for what you're doing here at Transmart. And then wrap it up with, with some thoughts and, and time for questions. So first off, the Open Clinica community is a global community. Uh, it's, uh, as Keith mentioned, an open source clinical trial software platform. Uh, there are, we estimate, over 1,400 installations of Open Clinica around the world. It's used in thousands of research studies. And we have a, a global community of over 20,000 registered members. And you can see, it might be a little small up here, um, you know, the, the growth in the, the Registered uh, members at our openclinica.com community site 
um, over the years. Open Clinic is used in across the spectrum of clinical research studies and, and clinical trials. Uh, you know, there's a, a big usage in phase one through three interventional trials, but equally in phase four studies, investigator initiated uh, academic studies and, and other types of research. And it's a global community. Uh, we have a large representation uh, from Europe, a uh, large user base there, uh, users in Asia, Australia, Africa, South America, and North America. So what is it? Uh, at its heart, Open Clinica is an electronic data capture system. If you're not familiar with what that is, uh, it's a uh, system for designing electronic case report forms, putting them into the structure of a study protocol, and allowing the uh, uh, doctors and nurses investigators and clinical research coordinators in a clinical trial to enter data on their patients uh, into a central repository. Uh, it comes with uh, tools for clinical data management to make sure the data are, are clean and verified. Uh, it's highly configurable with minimal technical knowledge. Uh, and that's one of the things we strive to do is provide a tremendous amount of power through configuration as opposed to uh, code or programming. And because of the large open source community we have, there are many options to extend it with additional modules, uh, with integrations with other systems, and, uh, and uh, we have a powerful web services API to help uh, do that. It's a 100% web-based user interface. So in Open Clinica, uh, you can build custom electronic case report forms. You can reuse those across your studies. Uh, in your study protocol, you can design your schedule of visits, create edit checks that you know, look at uh, what, what data ranges should be, look at conditional values across forms, create skip patterns in, in how you're uh, presenting your questionnaires, all those types of things. Uh, workflows for data management um, are uh, in the system out of the box. Uh, so clinical monitoring, data review, uh, source data verification, other things typically used in clinical trials. And uh, because clinical trials are so heavily regulated, uh, obviously security, uh, privacy, and traceability are important. So we have a role-based access system. Uh, all the clinical data in the system is tracked with audit trails. We have the capabilities for electronic signatures, so you can use it in a um, uh, what's called a 21 CFR Part 11 uh, compliant manner. And that's the part of the code of regulations that governs electronic records in clinical trials. Really fun stuff. As a business, uh, and I'll talk about who we are in a second, we offer an enterprise edition of Open Clinica. So this is uh, off the same open code repository as uh, the community distribution or, or what anyone else would get on GitHub. There's, there's one or two uh, relatively minor add-ins. And we deliver it as a software as a service model, uh, provide ongoing maintenance, upgrades, support for regulatory compliance, uh, training, et cetera. And I say this not as an adver advertisement, but to give you an idea of our model. Uh, let me go back one second. Uh, so as opposed to tra Transmart, which uh, is pursuing a foundation model, you know, we started as a for-profit entity um, with the vision of improving health outcomes through open technology. Uh, we felt there was an opportunity and a need in the space for an open system that was easily adoptable, uh, flexible, highly configurable, and you know, could be consumed in a number of different ways, uh, whether you know, with full commercial support or on your own do-it-yourself or with the, the collaboration of a community. We started doing that in 2006. Uh, we currently have 29 employees and we're headquartered in Massachusetts. Uh, the users of Open Clinica represent the, the gamut of organizations that run clinical research. Uh, industry sponsors, pharmaceutical, biotech, med device, uh, contract research organizations, academic centers, governmental and non-governmental agencies. And you know, we've, we've really benefited from the flourishing of, of a very diverse community where there's a, a rich set of options uh, for how you can Get into and get familiar with Open Clinica, uh, use it, adopt it, contribute and develop uh, with it, 
and uh, you know, make a living off it. We have an ecosystem of service providers and consultants uh, in addition to our own company. So hopefully that's a, a useful background on where I'm coming from. Um, I get a lot. I get asked a lot. You know, why did you do this? Why, why did you, why did you, start this project, release it as open source? Uh, um, you know, I believe, like E.O. Wilson has observed with ants, when you set the right conditions, uh, you can really get uh, tremendous benefits uh, um, for in, in an open source model. Uh, when you can rapidly download and try things for free when you can share ideas with the community with little to no barriers in a highly transparent way. Uh, you can contribute to and improve each other's source code. Uh, some amazing things can happen. And they don't happen always, but they can happen if you set the right, set the right environment. Uh, so by removing those barriers, you create a much easier path to evaluation and potential adoption for new ent entrants into the community. Uh, you create the potential for technologies uh, whether it's within your project or across projects, especially across projects, uh, for things to get mashed up in highly innovative and uh, uh, creative ways. And you have the upper opportunity for best practices to, to emerge very quickly and get shared very quickly. Uh, you know, businesses and you know, everyone here is part of a business, whether it's a nonprofit, a institution, or, or a, a for-profit company, um, you know, can benefit from that and focus on where they contribute and, and develop value rather than uh, on the plumbing. So I like this graph. This is not my graph, but uh, you know it illustrates where you get a lot of the power out of open source. You know, in any typical software project, you have you know growth to a, a few developers on the x-axis here, and when you're at that point, you're you know if your developers are, are doing a good job. Uh, you have, tend to have few defects. As the team gets bigger, you know, the interactions get more complex, and often uh, that spikes, and you start to have quality issues. As the team gets a little bigger than that, uh, you can put in place the structures, the processes, the checks, um, you know, to start to reduce that. And you know, the line here where you see the dollars is kind of where, where, success, you know, where commercial companies aspire to get to. You know, a big team, a uh, big enough team to provide a, a good quality product with, with ever improving features. But they can't really get beyond a certain point. Maybe some of the very largest companies can, but um, the open source advantage is the potential to go far beyond that. So what makes that work? What will help attract those participants how do you achieve the far right of that graph where the developers are many, the contributors are many, and the product improves rapidly and maintains a high level of quality? It doesn't happen automatically. Uh, we'd love to release version 0.1 of our technology and have developers flock to it and automatically improve it. Uh, that doesn't, doesn't likely occur. Um, there are hundreds of open source projects that, that really never get off the ground. So, so we want to aspire to be like the, some of the real successful ones. I believe there are three components. There's collaboration, innovation, and passion. Let's start with collaboration. It's important to mem remember we live in the real world. Incentives matter. So what are those incentives? What are some of the incentives that can really encourage an open source uh, participant to contribute in a meaningful way uh, to, the, to the project. Well, from a developer perspective, when others can help you improve or maintain your module or code or the documentation for it or the testing of it, uh, that's a pretty good incentive. You know, we all, wanna, we all wanna do a great job with our work. We wanna see our work product be of high quality. So, so that in itself is an incentive. You have the opportunity to learn from others. I mean, we're all here, we're all learning, um, and that's a great incentive. You get recognition, uh, you know, the transparency of open source, the ability to really, really build a, a, a portfolio of, of, of work that you can take with you no matter where you go in your career is, is, is something that's intrinsic to the, the transparent model of open source. And ideally, you know, you can make a living doing this. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, open source, if it ever was, it's no longer 
you know, the, the kids in their mother's basement hacking on code. Um, it's, a, it's a professional endeavor. So we'll talk about how you can, how you can do those things. Uh, this slide is from the Apache Foundation, who's obviously one of the most successful open source uh, uh, foundations, and, and a lot of their technology projects are extremely successful. And uh, you know, they look at the importance of uh, two factors in, in an open source project over time. Starts off, the code has to be good, and you have to be solving an important problem. But over time, you know, the community becomes the greatest source of value, the greatest factor of success. And that community can be made up of very diverse participants. You know, everyone can't write code, um, but everyone can collaborate and participate in some way, whether you're a developer, you're contributing to the design of the product, to the use case, to the um, uh, documentation, or the evangel evangelization. So ultimately, what are we collaborating on? Well, we're working on tools that help scientists answer important research questions that ultimately will improve lives and improve health. I think that's clearly a pretty, pretty important goal. In the EDC world, we, always, we also look at the plight of clinical data managers uh, and uh, you know, say, well, till recently, paper was everyone's favorite tool. So the more we can streamline those workflows, we think that's an important problem to solve as well. Uh, the, the second of those three points, collaboration, innovation, and passion, is innovation. Uh, innovation doesn't occur in a vacuum. Some would argue it doesn't occur in a word cloud either. Uh, but today, more than ever, uh, um, collaboration is the root of innovation. It's where you share ideas. It's where you get unexpected uh, confluences of, of uh, people's efforts. And uh, I'm really excited to be here to build bridges between Transmart and Open Clinica. Um, a lot of the talk yesterday about building better APIs. Um, uh, I'll talk in a little bit how that's something we did with our community. You know, we didn't really know what value it was going to provide if people were going to use it, but it's been tremendously successful over the past few years. You breed innovation by recognizing and rewarding it. Uh, as I discussed, you can do that in a lot of ways you know, other than direct uh, financial ways. Uh, of course, that's always a good one. Um, but, uh, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, it you know, the, the principle of meritocracy is deeply imbued in most of the really successful open source projects. That doesn't mean, you know, it's only the people that write the code that, you know, get to govern the project and, and get recognized. But, you know, that's definitely an important one. Um, but everyone who's making a contrib contribution that produces value, um, you know, really, Really, you know, you, you want to structure your, your project and, and build the, the, uh, the environment so that that really gets recognized and rewarded. Associated with that, the principle of release early and release often uh, really contributes to the potential for innovation. Uh, you know, we want, to, we want to build and share and iterate very quickly uh, because by doing that in a highly open and transparent manner, that's, that's where we start to get uh, you know, the greatest leverage out of, out of our community. And last but not least is passion. You know, passion is kind of an intangible secret sauce. Uh, it's different for everybody. Uh, every one of you here, you know, if we ask what's your motivation for being, being here, you know, why do you feel strongly about Transmart, you probably have a slightly different answer. Um, but really, you know, the core mission of what Transmart does and the value that, that has the potential to deliver to science and society uh, is, is, I bet, the root of that passion for a lot of you. And when you combine that collaboration and passion, you get a, a real opportunity to build a strong culture. Uh, there was discussion yesterday about the, the three Cs. Um, there was some joking at dinner about a fourth C, which is cash. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that was after a little bit of wine. Um, and I believe a fifth C uh, that's really a, a combination of a lot of those things is, is culture. Uh, when you build a great culture, 
you know, you have the opportunity to uh, attract highly loyal adherents. Uh, you, you can really amplify the word of mouth and the excitement that people bring uh, and spread about your project. And uh, you get better feedback, you get better contributions, you know, higher standards of qualities and expectations for participants, um, but still that spirit of collaboration and, and uh, invitation and you have the potential to, to really have more fun, to, to bond and, and build relationships that, that make, uh, you know, ultimately make you successful. Okay, so that's all pretty general stuff on open source, but you know, it's really flavored with my experiences over the past uh, eight or nine years in, in building the Open Clinical Project. Uh, so I'm gonna go into some more specifics, where we've been, where we are today, uh, what we've learned along the way. And uh, when we started the Open Clinical Project in 2005, you know, as I said, we felt there was a real need in the marketplace for a easily adapt adoptable platform, something that was flexible, something that could be consumed in much more of a do-it-yourself manner than comparable commercial products uh, we're offering at the time, you know, that included the ability to kind of uh, get to different price points, uh, um, you know, whether you were doing it yourself or hiring somebody for services, et cetera. Um, and of course, it needed to do data management really well. Uh, so, you know, we really started on the basis of, you know, we can provide an open source platform for data capture and data management that's cost efficient, that allows flexibility, uh, that's more secure because of the, you know, the transparency of the process and the code. Uh, that has plenty of support, plenty of options for support, a large community. Um, and, uh, you know, it would be a product that we felt uh, as people accrued to the community would, would be a product that people would be proud of and feel loyal to. We succeeded pretty early in generating a lot of word of mouth, a lot of adoption of the system, uh, fast growth in our community. And what I think we did well from the start there uh, was we established and communicated some core values and we stuck to them. Uh, as a for-profit, that was critically important for us, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, the perception is that our incentives wouldn't always be aligned with, with producing open code and, and sharing that in, in, a, uh, in a highly transparent way. Uh, associated with that, we made our IP practices clear. We picked a license, the LGPL license, one of the standard off the shelf, uh, open source licenses, we developed a trademark policy. Uh, we were clear that from the beginning that Open Clinic LLC wasn't necessarily gonna put 100% of what we produced uh, licensed as open source, but that we had a commitment to make sure that there would be, would always be a fully feature complete, successful, usable, standalone EDC system that was 100% open source. Uh, so that, you know, really communicating those things early and often helped us establish trust with, with some of the early uh, adopters and, and you know, early uh, uh, um, contributors to our community. Uh, we combined this with really encouraging open, unmoderated communication. Um, this acronym PRIM, which, which also comes from uh, Apache, is, uh, is I think a really good one. Uh, you know, there's uh, been studies done that every successful open source project has a portal a repository, an issue tracker, and a mailing list. Um, you know, that may seem like second nature today, um, you know, but it, it, it's not always uh, um, obvious. And, and uh, you know, you wanna make sure that, that you have those four things, that they're highly accessible, highly visible, and that it's clear, you know, that, that uh, each contributor, you know, has as much uh, ability to, to share their ideas and communicate as, as the next. Uh, we made it easy to get the code. Uh, we made it easy to download the software. Um, it wasn't necessarily very easy to install at that point, but you could at least get the code and get the package. Um, a few things that in retrospect ended up being very important. When we first released Open Clinica, we didn't have a defined API. That, that took a while to develop. Um, and, uh, but there were a couple small things that, that happened that made a huge difference. For instance, um, you know, we have a, a tool for designing case report forms in Open Clinica. It's a template in Excel where you define your fields, you upload it to the system, and uh, it generates your form from that. And we had a, a big debate internally about, you know, should we allow, uh, should we allow HTML and JavaScript tags in, in these fields? Um, you know, is there a security risk? You know, would that create too much uh, 
give people too much rope to hang themselves. And you know, we ended up coming down on the side of allowing it. And you know, over the years, there's, there's built up this tremendous font of innovation of people writing very complex things that we never would have imagined uh, you know, by using widely, widely uh, understood markup languages and, and, uh, and scripting languages. So, so you know, those extension points that are you know, familiar, use technologies that are familiar to your audience, uh, uh, wherever you can do those, do them. Um, and then a little further, further along, as we did get into building an API, um, and even in our internal data model, we, we did our best to adhere to adopted uh, and uh, recognized standards. Uh, uh, particularly the one we use is, is the CDISC uh, ODM, the operational data model that's a, a, um, a structural standard for describing clinical trials and clinical trials data. You know, so establishing that, that trust and that, those principles of freedom and transparency early on were important. Um, we publish our backlog and roadmap at jira.openclinica.com. Uh, so anyone can go in, they can see what our team's working on now, you know, what uh, external work is coming in, what's in the roadmap, what's in the queue, you know, what, what the bug and defect list is currently. Uh, this really empowers users. Uh, we didn't use Jira at the start, we used another open source technology called Mantis, but we recently migrated to Jira. It's a little more powerful. Uh, gives you fancy graphs and stuff like that. But in principle, it's the same thing. It's an issue tracker, you know, uh, project management and, and prioritization tool. It's been highly, uh, highly effective for us. So those are some of the things that I think at least that, that we did, we got pretty, pretty close to right at the start. But after Going back to this graph, you know, after a couple of years, we were seeing you know great adoption, uh, great participation in the community, you know, extensions and innovation happening, you know, like I said, in in you know scripting in in our case report forms, things that we didn't really imagine at first, uh, but we really weren't getting that many external contributors to the code, or at least not as many as we thought we would. Um, you know, so so we sat down, we started to think about well, what. Why might that be the case? Maybe that's just how it's going to be, and you know, if so, we'll we'll accept that and and uh, you know figure out a model that works going forward. Um, you know, but as we looked at it and as we tried different things, we learned a few important lessons. And you know, in learning these lessons and making subsequent adjustments, you know, we've started to to get further and further to to the right of that graph. Um, the most important one is uh, you know, respond quickly when you get a contribution and keep the barriers low. Uh, you know, whether that means you know, the complexity of setting up your development environment or you know, the source code management system you're using. Um, you know, we always had an open source code repository. We started off using Subversion. Uh, we moved later to Mercurial uh, and now we're on GitHub. We only moved to GitHub earlier this year. Um, but it was our first move from kind of hosting these repositories ourselves uh, and allowing external access and contribution to just using the tool that you know, everyone uses today. It's the cool thing. It's where all the open source projects were. So it didn't seem like a huge change for us. Uh, and yet, as soon as we made the change, you know, we saw a, a, a spike in the rate of contributions. Uh, really just lowered the barriers to people, you know, if they've worked on you know, a fix or something that improves their situation and they want to share it back. Um, you know, developers generally understand how to do that on GitHub. It's very easy. You know, we can put it in our queue very easily. So that made a huge difference. And, and things like that that don't always seem, um, seem like big changes when you're, when you're kind of down in the weeds and you're already used to your systems uh, can really have a tremendous impact. So put the code where the developers are uh, on GitHub, as said. Uh, we also, about two years ago, really, really, um, in trying to adopt a, we tried for a long time to adopt a real agile uh, uh, software development attitude and methodology. And that's very hard in clinical research because, you know, if you, wanna, if you want your system be, to be used in regulated environments, uh, you have to validate your system. And that means having defined written processes in your organization uh, that define how you create requirements you know, how those requirements map to specifications, how you test those, 
and that every release has all these things tested and you have artifacts that you can show people that they want to come see them. And that paradigm was created you know, 25 years ago or longer. Uh, so it's really oriented to a waterfall type of, uh, uh, type of approach. Um, so we struggle with trying to do Agile and you know, still producing this, this massive documentation for our enterprise customers for a long time, and it was really dragging down our productivity. A uh, couple things we, we finally figured out um, that I think apply whether you have to deal with all that, the regulatory stuff or not, because in the end, if you do that, that stuff right, that helps increase the quality of your product. Um, one was time boxed releases. Said, we're gonna set a release schedule um, and the release is going out on the date the release is going out. Whatever features aren't ready, they're not going in. Um, and uh, you know, that takes some planning. That takes knowing that you're not gonna get everything you want in on the date, but you can have confidence that the next release will be the next month or three months or however long your, your schedule is. Um, so people you know, generally adjust to that. And you combine that with having a prioritized list. Um, you know, we, we used to try to classify, okay, this feature, this, this bug fix, this other thing, you know, is it, is it a high priority? Is it you know, medium or low? Of course, everything becomes high in that case, right? So yeah, you know, the idea of having one list of priorities ordered relative to all the other priorities is, is, uh, has been a really powerful thing for us. Of course, that's, you know, that's mostly for our internal development team. Um, you know, because external uh, contributors may, may shoot in something that, you know, is the source code complete feature that, you know, we think is gonna be useful to uh, other open clinical users. And, you know, that will, as soon as that comes in, uh, um, you know, it'll, it'll shoot up the list of priorities. But, but that, that idea of having one backlog is, is really important. And combined with that, work in small increments. So we, we make a strong effort to define what we call minimally releasable features. Um, you know, so that we know, you know, however our estimation is for a given time boxed release, you know, we're working in small enough increments that, you know, we're gonna get through a couple of these features. They may be very small features, uh, but they are big enough to be viable and usable on their own. Um, and uh, then we break those up into user stories, which, you know, one story may be, you know, the create function of a record. One may be the edit. Uh, you know, one may be the the read. You know, that kind of thing. Um, of course, they're often more complex than that. But uh, uh, to you know, break the work up into that and to continually just try to break it down into smaller and smaller chunks uh, really helps us in the prioritization process, in the development effort, and uh, and also in uh, testing as well. And I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so when you do that, you're, you're time boxing releases, you're working in small increments. Um, you know, we try to release, uh, uh, you know, we're working towards getting to a continuous delivery model where releases are, you know, code, any developer commits code and it immediately goes into a production capacity, whether or not the feature is active or not. And, you know, I think we'll get there next year. Um, but, uh, you know, in open source, having nightly builds uh, that people can come and test and experiment with. Uh, obviously, committing your code into the, the source repository uh, daily um, as much as you can is, is critical. Test, test, test. Um, you know, some of the, I'm a relative outside of the Transmart community. I'm really, really happy to be here and learn. But, you know, some of the discussion I heard yesterday about, uh, you know, the, the testing efforts for version 1.2 reminded me of, you know, uh, how we used to handle releases and, and the, you know, the concerted effort that had to go into uh, testing, you know, six weeks of, you know, testing, 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 finding issues, you know, the, the timeline being extended out and, uh, you know, retesting before we can get to a release. We made um, a huge effort starting about two and a half years ago to really adopt automated testing uh, approaches. And while it was highly, very costly um, and required a lot of organizational learning, um, you know, the payoff has been tremendous uh, because now when there's a new code commit, you know, it comes with the test. Uh, we've actually have more commits to our, our test repository than to our code repository over the last six months. Um, and we know that the regression tests are gonna run and they'll either sum up to green or red. And if they're red, something's wrong. You know, either a test is now obsolete or the new code broke the test. And, um, the value you get in that is, is just tremendous. It's really hard to do, you know, with a highly configurable system like, like an electronic case report form system. Uh, 
I imagine TransSmart is probably even more configurable and extensible. So uh, it, it's not an easy thing to do. But you know, there's talk yesterday of you know how do we invest in infrastructure? Well, I, I'd highly recommend you know that be one of your infrastructure priorities. Uh, at the same time, keep keep your libraries and components up to date. Again, when we were doing all manual testing, you know, we were scared to upgrade you know this framework or this library or go to the new version of Tomcat because you know, oh, well, now we have to test the whole thing and that costs us six weeks of time, uh, you know, hiring uh, uh, part-time, or hiring part-time testers or whatever we had to do. Uh, so once, you know, once we got that, um, even before we got the automation framework in place, you know, at some point we had to make the leap and say, you know, this is just the best thing to do for the software. Let's start doing this. Um, and once we got the automation framework in place, you know, we could do that with a tremendous amount of confidence. So the last lesson is, you know, do, uh, my numbers are wrong here, do five, six, and seven at the same time. And, uh, you know, like I said, you know, we, we've, we've really struggled in doing that, learning how to do that. But once you figure it out, it's, it's, it's incredibly valuable. And it, it really, you know, gives you uh, just a tremendous amount of uh, capability, you know, raises your, your velocity incredibly, and really just energizes the people that are contributing that are doing the development or, or helping to define the features and move the platform forward. We talk, as, as, uh, as I know Transmart does, uh, a lot about extensibility. Um, you know, as I said, the early versions of Open Clinica, you could configure your forms, set up your visit structure, um, but uh, you, know, you couldn't really programmatically extend it very easily. You could get under the hood and work with the core code, but that was about it. Um, we, one of our first major uh, external contributions to the project was, was the first version of our, our SOAP Web Services API. Uh, defined methods for you know, how to create a patient, you know, how to read the study definition, how to um, uh, import data, you know, a whole, whole host of other things. And uh, you know, we got that from somebody we we kind of knew, but not really. And you know, they had had you know four or five people working for several months on this. And you know, one day it just kind of came in over the transom, and we said, "Wow, this is this is fantastic. This is this is what what we what we hoped would happen." And so we we integrated that as quickly as we can. We spent you know at the time took a couple months to test it and release it. Um, you know, but that's really provided a cornerstone, uh, I think, for. Open Clinic has continued adoption because that makes possible a lot of the integration that, that's really uh, necessary and powerful. And ultimately is, is one of the main reasons people look to open source solutions, you know, because they believe, you know, there's a belief out there that generally it's easier to integrate uh, uh, very often an open source platform uh, than, than a commercial solution or, or even a homegrown solution. Uh, over the past two years, you know, we've also supplemented that with with a RESTful API paradigm. And that's, you know, we've communicated with our community and, you know, others involved in, in the architecture, you know, how that's going to be the, the uh, you know, the primary paradigm going forward for, for Open Clinica. Um, both of these heavily rely on our implementation internally of, uh, of the CDISC ODM data model. And, uh, you know, that's allowed, it's made it fairly easy to, you know, create an API architecture, um, you know, because we already had that in place. We knew that's a good thing to expose because there are other platforms that support it. There's a, a well-documented uh, well specification for it. Um, it's not perfect. It has its warts, uh, you know, when you're working with particular use cases and that data structure isn't, isn't what you'd ideally like. But, you know, modeling our APIs after that has, has been a big boost to, you know, making them easier to understand and, and uh, easier to support in, in various integration use cases. You know, I mentioned the development of CRF widgets. Uh, you know, people have built, you know, new input types, sliders, and, you know, uh, called jQuery, complex jQuery things, and uh, all sorts of stuff uh, um, embedded in the forms themselves. Uh, we have a plugin uh, format for extracts. And uh, while I think in concept it's, it's great, you know, with the number of contributions we've got there is fairly minimal because we, um, we adopted a technology to do it XML style sheets that ended up being not so familiar or easy to use for, uh, for uh, you know, the, the members of our community. Uh, so again, they're choosing familiar technologies uh, uh, is really important. And right now we're, we're in the process of, uh, of um, you know, moving towards a, a new architecture for that. 
And uh, um, translations, internationalizations was, was a big issue. Uh, from the start, we, we, uh, you know, we created from early on, not the very first version, the capability to, to uh, localize the software, uh, but we didn't do any translations. Uh, those came in from community members that were adopting it in, in all different locales, and, and that's been a, you know, a really highly collaborative effort. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we have some other, you know, much more sophisticated in, uh, add ons and modules. Uh, one uh, built in, in Germany to incorporate, uh, you know, large scale image repositories and allow them to be uploaded through Open Clinica and embedded directly in the case report forms. And, you know, more and more things like that that, that are really, you know, more, more than just small incremental uh, updates or fixes. You know, I've talked about this, but you know, open clinica and clinical trials, good data is your cornerstone for success. You know, that includes not just the data itself, but the metadata about you know the structure of the trial, what question was asked, how it was captured, when, you know, um, and so forth, and then the providence of that. Uh, you know, providence is you know the history of an object or or piece of data. Um, you know, its its curation, where it came from, its origin, all that all that good stuff, and. Um, uh, you know, that's critical in clinical trials. I, I, it's probably even more critical in, in the types of research done in, um, uh, with Transmart. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've built that into our internal data model. It's been built into our APIs. And, uh, you know, using open published standards is, has been really helpful there. You don't want to adopt standards just because they're the standard, um, you know, but where they align with your business case, uh, we've found them to be really powerful. Uh, in terms of our tools and processes, I, you know, I talked a little bit already about GitHub and uh, test automation. Um, test automation, we, we primarily use a technology called Selenium, which does, you know, kind of uh, browser-based, uh, you know, you click and you record and it, it plays it back. Uh, uh, you can do it on different browsers. Um, we're doing more and more, um, you know, code-level unit tests now as well, um, kind of combining those two things together. Um, we've done so in the context of a methodology called behavior-driven development. Uh, this may or may not be something uh, uh, that, that is uh, useful for Transmart, but uh, it's been enormously successful for us. And you know, I'd like to, not a lot of people uh, know about it, so I'd like to uh, promote that I take a look at it. Uh, it basically combines the process of defining uh, features and user stories with how the system will be tested. Uh, and you get that all in one. And the great thing in clinical trials is that means you now have that traceability between your requirements and your test artifacts uh, that you need to have anyways to, to, uh, to meet the regulatory uh, uh, requirements of the space. Uh, but it does so in a highly agile way. Uh, you define high level features, those are our MRFs um, for each one of those. Um, you break it into user stories define acceptance criteria, and then you write what are called scenarios, which are basically you know, uh, 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 tiny uh, increments of what a user would do with the system. Um, and BDD uses a, a, a defined syntax um, that's very human readable, uh, and yet can be aligned with, uh, with uh, um, programs, automated tests particularly. It's a given, when, then syntax that turns out to be Quite simple and yet enormously powerful for, for, uh, for helping to ensure quality and ensure that the system design uh, does what it's designed to do. I want to also discuss uh, you know, the, the topic of DevOps, which is a you know, hot topic in, in a lot of technology communities these days. Um, it's where I think some of the best work in open source technology development is currently being done. Uh, how many of you here have heard of Vagrant? Okay, a few hands. Um, Docker? Okay, a few more. Um, and OpenStack? Okay, a few more. Uh, yeah, so OpenStack has, has gotten a lot of publicity because you know it's kind of a cornerstone of uh, a lot of the big cloud vendors. And, and um, uh, uh, But technologies like Vagrant and Docker, which allow you to easily script highly portable deployments, um, you know, can be pretty, pretty incredible uh, in an open source context. Uh, because again, lowering those barriers to entry, 
uh, whether it's for a new employee on the development team or a new organization that, that might want to um, look at Transmart or, or you know, even a, a student that, that, you know, looking for open source tools that, that can help, you know, uh, him or her do whatever innovative research they're trying to do. Um, you know, having, having some of these technologies, that are, they're extremely lightweight and uh, fairly easy to learn to write the basic scripts for. Um, you know, can be incredibly powerful. And in, our, in the world today, you know, just as with uh, mobile technology, you know, people's expectations that they can use the technology anywhere, anytime, um, you know, the, the, uh, is becoming an ingrained concept. Uh, the expectation that there's continuous delivery, you know, that things are constantly upgraded and going to be improving is, is more and more becoming um, uh, you know, a basic expectation. Not, not quite there yet, but I, I think it will be more and more over, over the next few years. And, you know, to effectively, uh, you know, do these things, it's not just the tools. Uh, it's the trust between the members of the community and their ability to work together. Um, and, you know, I, I really became a convert to this, this type of uh, approach and this perspective when, when I saw this, uh, this graphic. Um, it said, just ask yourself the question, how long would it take your organization to deploy a change that involved one single line of code? You know, if you think about that, in, in a lot of cases, it's, it's a pretty big number. <laughs> you know, it's, it's days or weeks or, you know, sometimes even months of effort. And, and if that's the case, you know, uh, you, know you, you just do the math, you, you look at the resources and the time spent on those things, and you say, can we do this better? Um, and when you do that in an open source context, all of a sudden you're sharing it with, with everyone in your community and you can get just kind of really exponentially increase that leverage you get out of, out of the collaboration. You know, the, the answer there for Transmart is probably very different. If it is a challenge with Transmart, probably very different than what it was with Open Clinica, but hopefully some of the, the particulars, the technologies we use and the approaches we've used uh, are helpful for you. So to wrap up, uh, you know, I'll talk a little bit about where we're going, um, uh, particularly with the trajectory of the Open Clinica technology and our, our vision for, you know, what a, what a highly um, capable, widely used EDC system, uh, you know, can be the core of, where it can be the core of, of uh, innovation in the future. Um, you know, the two, two big priorities from a, a kind of strategic direction point of view are, for us, are to you know, provide the ability to engage patients and to embrace the use of mobile technologies. Uh, those, those kind of go hand in hand because, you know, especially when you're dealing with, with uh, you know, patients in a trial, uh, you know, they want to be able to do this anytime, anywhere, whether it's completing an assessment, getting a reminder about their schedule, uh, you know, or even getting invitations to enroll in, in, uh, in trials that they may be, they may be um, uh, uh, interested in. Uh, we're working to continually lower, lower the barriers. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with Vagrant, uh, you know, they have a, a really catchy phrase, which is, you know, Vagrant up. And it looks at your script, which can be as little as three lines and generates an entire virtual machine off of that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not that it will automate all the most sophisticated, uh, you know, large scale deployments for you, but you know, just, just kind of getting those barriers to initial entry out of the way can be very powerful. So we're trying to do that with Open Clinic as well. We're not quite there yet, um, but we're trying to do that so that you can check out the code and get there uh, off of GitHub, or that you can come to our website more on a commercial basis, just sign up for a free trial, start using the software on a, on a hosted basis right away. Um, and, you know, we've been doing this for nine years now. Some parts of the code with, with uh, you know, really kept up to date or, you know, recently updated major, major parts of it to, to keep it modern. But, you know, a lot of it is, is at a point now where uh, we have to modernize it. We have to adopt modern frameworks, uh, especially if we want to embrace mobile. Um, and we need to do that while maintaining uh, good continuity for our current users, making sure the quality is there, the traceability, and that we support them as, as the user interface changes and, and functionalities change and, and get added. So, so that's one of our, one of our biggest... Uh, priorities and, and challenges right now. You know, I think we're uh, in, the, in the community level, um, working to increase the awareness of, you know, who is working on what. 
Uh, we recently published an extensions directory. Uh, a lot of them are links to GitHub projects. Others are you know, directly downloadable, but various things that you know, extend the functionality and capabilities of Open Clinica. One of them is a, a, uh, a Transmart um, uh, integrator that was uh, published by our friends at, at uh, Trait in the Netherlands. Um, we moved from a mailing list to web-based forums with, with email notifications, and, and that's been very successful to increase the usability and the ability for people to participate uh, and keep up to date on the latest conversations. Uh, I talked about using GitHub and Jira and just continuing to get better at that and to make it easier for our communities, uh, community members to come in and see what's going on. I don't know if you've ever used Jira, but it's, it's quite a beast. So um, uh, you know, simplifying it is, is, is one of our challenges. And um, uh, you know, one of our, in addition to code contributions, one of our uh, um, you know, greatest uh, uh, community contribution is ongoing development of a, a, a community-based wiki book that really provides best practices and documentation for um, uh, you know, how to do more advanced. We have the basic documentation we publish on our site, but, but the wiki book provides a lot of the, the corner cases and innovative things, and, and uh, continuing to support that is, is uh, very important for us. Um, and you know, I'm so excited to be here because uh, I want to build bridges with other open source communities. Again, I think that's where a lot of the power of open source comes from and a lot of the potential for innovation. Um, so uh, working with Transmart, uh, uh, we work working more and more closely with, with um, technologies uh, for field-based mobile data capture, um, particularly in Keto and Open Data Kit, and I encourage you to take a look at them if, if that's an area you're interested in. Um, things like R that help do analytics and, and visualization, and you know, there are lots of others. And you know, in the slightly longer term, we're looking at other ways we can align incentives for users, for service providers, and developers to make sure that you know, the participation in the sharing, uh, the coordination, and the contrib contribution of code back to the core, uh, or sharing of your innovation, continues uh, or, or increases, uh, you know, the um, continues to be in the self-interest of those participants because you know, ultimately you'll do that uh, maybe out of altruism for a while, uh, whether it's you individually or your organization, but ultimately there has to be a benefit back to you. Um, and like I said, setting those conditions, getting those right is so important. You never get them perfectly right, so it's a constant process of iteration. Uh, so we're exploring you know, enabling, you know, on top of the extension site we already published, things that are all free and open source, um, allowing some paid extensions. Um, better support for built-in metrics and feedback. Uh, uh, that was a topic discussed yesterday, and, you know, we're in kind of a similar position where, you know, we don't know a lot of, you know, uh, what the usage is in the open source community. Um, you know, we think we get good feedback, but we know there's a lot of people that aren't being as vocal as, as others and, and would love to engage them more. Um, and uh, you know, to better modularize the system so you can snap in additional functionality um, uh, you know, in a more modular fashion. So uh, I'd, I'd like to thank Keith and the foundation and, and all of you for having me here today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, uh, I think we might have a couple minutes for any questions. So that was that was great. I I was looking around the room, seeing lots of people taking notes. That was, <laughs> that was excellent from that perspective. I even saw Ek there taking notes. <laughs> um, are there questions for Cal? We have time for a couple of questions. Jay. Th thanks, Cal. And actually, maybe we'll extend a little bit of our conversation from last night. I guess first, how do you how do you value Open Clinica as a company and the Open Clinica community? And let's say here's something like the Transmart Foundation, where you need to value the foundation based on the community. How how do you do that? And then secondly, of all the the technolo technology barriers that you're trying to to lower. Are there any barriers that you think are important to uh, to build around around Open Clinica, and and what are those barriers? Thanks. 
so, you know, to answer the first question, you know, how we look at, uh, um, you know, the, the community and the open source activities in, in our commercial business, uh, you know, in the beginning, um, uh, you know, we, A, we've, we've uh, you know, we've, we've grown the company in a, in a largely organic fashion. Uh, we never took outside capital, um, had some grant funding initially that, that helped do this and, you know, helped uh, catalyze our, our uh, ability to commit to open source early. Early on, you know, it's really, this is a way to get, uh, you know, a lot of exposure, a lot of, you know, initial adoption and evaluation. You know, we can turn that into, you know, provision of services on a commercial basis. Um, now we're, you know, we've been doing that for a while. Uh, um, you know, we've really shifted the focus on a, from a community point of view to really say, how can we focus on those that want to develop and those that want to, you know, collaborate on improving the product. And, you know, obviously there's a huge overlap between those populations, but, you know, right now our emphasis from a community perspective is, you know, what can we do to, uh, um, you know, to help invite new contributors uh, to the party or help maximize the efforts of existing ones. Um, you know, that can include commercial partnerships. Uh, so we just, uh, just announced a partnership with a clinical trials management system uh, company in Rochester. Uh, product's called Clinical Conductor. It's a proprietary product, but, you know, they've used our API to integrate with, with uh, Open Clinica quite closely on a, a few uh, mutual customers we had. And, you know, now we're... Uh, right now, just with them, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, but, you know, since the API is open, any of those companies can, can kind of come to the table really on their own as well. Uh, you know, but, but the, the kind of, our preference is to work with other open source projects or open source businesses, of course, because, you know, there's more of an alignment there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and we're not religious about it. Uh, you know, I think being too religious about it can, can, can be a, negative um, let's see what was the second part of your question Bar so so are we interested in creating barriers to I mean I guess it, at some level you know we believe the you know the software as a service solution making things as self-service as possible uh, turnkey on a hosted basis um, you know doing that well can can really make the equation of uh, you know should I go with you know, some open source, you know, do it myself approach or, or with the hosted version, uh, you know, an easy equation. Uh, you know, um, in terms of, you know, barriers, we hope that we can align the incentives of the community enough uh, uh, to not, you know, fork the product and go off and kind of create their own distributions. That's been done, um, you know, a few times and, you know, we, we it happens, it's part of the game. Uh, but, uh, you know, we try to, try to create enough of, um, you know, a kind of, um, uh, you know, critical mass in the community uh, where it's not in people's interest to go do that. Let me ask a, a quick related question. Uh, on a for-profit company basis, when you look at software companies, there's sort of the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your revenue is generated by 20% of your customers. With your open source model, do you have that same kind of distribution or is it different? Actually, no. Uh, we did for a long time. So we started in 06, we had version 1.0, and, you know, our business then was, you know, at first it was grants, but then it was, um, uh, you know, custom development. So an adopter needed this feature. And we started to do training, and we started to kind of formalize that and package that uh, a little better. Uh, we started to do support and uh, help desk, and, you know, over time that, that became more, more systematic. And so it was in uh, 2010 we officially christened the Enterprise Edition where all that was kind of packaged on a turnkey basis. So right now, 70% of our revenue is subscription. Uh, we have uh, uh, close to 90 customers, and um, you know, no one of them is, 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 uh, is much bigger than, than yeah, the other. I mean, it would seem to me from a for-profit company business, the ability to diversify your customer base and diversify your revenue stream would actually be a barrier to entry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, we've, we've deliberately, we could have grown bigger than we are revenue-wise if we essentially became a CRO, <laughs> you know? Um, we get a lot of requests for, can you give us the technology and do the data management for the study? Um, and we don't do that. Uh, uh, a, that makes, you know, CROs very interested in becoming our customers because we're not competing with them. Right. Um, you know, but also we think it would, 
it would take away from our focus and our ability to put the best technology product out there. Is that it also is seem, is from a market force perspective with a drive towards more precision medicine, you're looking at a lot more smaller trials yeah. in which yeah. you would have a competitive advantage. Yeah. yeah, and we're really excited about the potential there and yeah. you know the ability to kind of engage directly with patients as part of that. Great. Other questions? Time for one more, Brian. I was, I was interested in a little comment about the CFR Part 11 compliance and also the licensing stuff. I could talk about Part 11 for two hours. I know I you can, so I need the short version, uh, but I, 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 I'm August. interested in your, <laughs> you know, the motivations for that and how you feel that that plays into what Transmart's got to do in the future. Um, yeah, so, you know, exactly how it applies to what Transmart does, I'm, I'm not as sure. Um, I do know, uh, A, you know, it, it can be immensely complex. You know, there's, there's, you know, reams of regulations and things written about the regulations and commentary to, you know, read through and understand. But at the end of the day, you know, if you have a, if you have a good process that, that really contributes to quality, all you have to do is write down your process and then show you're adhering to that. Uh, and, um, you know, like I said, for us, we, it was a big drag on our, you know, productivity in other areas for a long time. But, you know, once we kind of figured out this this BDD model, it really yeah. all came together, and now I think it it it, it helps. Uh, yeah, sure it does. Uh, the other things we're doing. Now, and how about the licensing stuff with the um, you know LGPL? You know, this has been a discussion we've had here. Yeah, that, that's a it's a good question. We we adopted that uh, you know from the start. Uh, we've had a few discussions about you know should we should we change the license? Is it is that possible? Uh, you know, given who's contributed what, uh, we haven't done. You know, we didn't ask for copyright assignment, which I know some open source projects have done. Um, you know, but we think it's uh, you know it's a decent it's a decent license. It allows you to you know incorporate parts of the project as libraries into other works without you know needing to worry about um, now everything has to be GPL. Um, you know, but it's it's uh, it's um, you know copy left enough that you know it it encourages people to share back with the core. So um, you know there's. There's different models, you know. They 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 all can be successful. Uh, this one's been been pretty good for us, I think. Of course, one of the big challenge, you know, the first uh, three or four years we were doing this, we spent probably the majority of our time communicating what open source is and yeah. you know what this particular license means. And, you know, thankfully we don't have to do that as much uh, uh, anymore. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and you know we have we have a you know significant percent of our enterprise customers they they just they treat it as a as a commercial off the shelf product or as a software as a service solution. They don't really care that it's open source, and I don't know what that number is. Maybe it's a third of them, but you know the other two thirds and the the ones using the community they kind of understand what open source means and what it can mean for them in terms of you know helping them. Great. Let's uh, thank Cal again for a great talk and a stimulating discussion. Thank Thanks, you for having me. Thanks for watching. Next up, we have uh, a panel, and we have uh, that panel is led by uh, Jan Willem Boyden. Are you going to? You want to come and introduce the panel? Okay. And if we can ask the panelists to come up, here you can start here while they're setting up for you. Yeah. So. Um, what we will do now uh, is to have a uh, panel discussion on uh, the deployment of Transmart, which I think is one of the crucial success factors of, uh, of Transmart for the, for the year to come. Uh, and fortunately, we do have a very distinguished uh, panel for this. Um, first of all, Yike Gouy, I think all of you know uh, him. Um, um, we've, uh, we've got Jay Bergeron, and uh, we've got um, now, I think. A very difficult name from Deloitte, uh, Ran Ranif Narif? Ramin, uh, Ranim. Ah, sorry, sorry about that. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I will do is I, I will have a few slides uh, to, to set the scene and, and basically um, uh, yeah, try to explain to you why I think this is very crucial for the, um, for the success of, uh, of Transmart. And then uh, we will give the floor to the, to the panel to give their take on it, and then we'll open the, the, the floor for the audience to ask questions to this panel. So wh where I'm coming from is the trade project, uh, as introduced by, um, by Gerrit yesterday. And um, 
what we try to do in, in, in trade is support the entire workflow for trans translational research projects. So all the way from the, the patient uh, introduction to the data integration, data analytics, where we selected Transmars. And so we have an old, uh, we have an, an, a big tool set that we try to support for these, uh, these scientists, but uh, Transmart, as Gerrit explained yesterday, is really our centerpiece. It's the, the central tool in, uh, in this tool set. Yeah, so, um, and we came to this conclusion pretty early on. Uh, we, uh, we were actually, we hosted one of the, uh, the Transmart annual meetings before it was called that way. Yeah. So there was some in Amsterdam, uh, somewhere in, uh, in, in the beginning of 2013. And uh, you still see f many faces that you see here. Um, but when, when we look at the, the uptake of the tools in, in, in the trade community, you see that some of the tools are highly uh, successful. So Open Clinica, which was nicely introduced by, by Cal in the previous talk, we have 120 studies in, uh, in this, used productively by hundreds of scientists every day nowadays. And we get new stu studies on board every month. Huh? The same in the imaging world, we have um, selected a couple of uh, imaging tools, so MBIA is the largest one uh, there, and we have 25 image collections uh, from studies across the country and across Europe. Uh, but then we go to, to Transmart, and where are we now after nearly two years? So we have two proof-of-concept installations, so one in colon cancer and one in uh, prostate cancer. And, um, so, and that's the focus for me for today. So, uh, what can we learn from these successful guys and, uh, and see how we can, uh, can change this? Huh? Because, yeah, we all know this, uh, this hype cycle of, um, of Gardner. Uh, so, um, we, we, are, uh, we have very high um, uh, expectations from it, but yeah, at some point you get the dissolution and, and we need to avoid that or at least uh, come to the slope of enlightenment. Huh? So for me, for me, uh, as I look at, at trade specifically and at the community, Transmart community in general, I think there are three priorities for 2015. So these are users, users, and more users. So that's really what we need. Huh? And, we, and when, when you have got the users, then the funding is a lot easier to attract. Uh, so uh, both for trade and for the Transmart Foundation, uh, I, I, I think we have uh, funding for the, for the years to come, but we have to look further and see how we can we really become sustainable. And um, yeah, so that's something we learned from the banks. Eh? So you must make sure that you become really big, then you're too big to fail, and then the funders need to support you. Eh? And that's, that's really the way I look at it. And yeah, after this introduction, so I would like to give the floor to the, to the panelists, and um, yeah, uh, I would like to ask them to give a quick introduction. So who are you, your users? How did you get them on board? Uh, what states are you? So what are, the, what are your successes? What, uh, what are the lessons learned? So maybe uh, each of you can, uh, yeah, can make a start with that and then we can open the floor to the audience for, for further questions. So uh, who's first, please? Okay, I'll be first. So first question is who are you? Who are you? Yeah. So I, uh, my name's Ravine Sharma and um, I've been in the software and analytics space for about 20 years. And um, a lot of the focus of what I've had to do in various roles has been on coming up with compelling use cases so people actually use the systems and use the software. So this is just another exercise in, in that kind of continuum. And um, one of the things that struck me uh, last night, <clears throat> besides all, all the wine that we had, <laughs> was um, the image of if you build it, they will come. And I think we're going to have a bit of a discussion on that. And that's, that's a noble statement. I think when you look at it from the perspective of user adoption and users, what we really want are season's ticket holders, not just people who come to one or two games. And so how do you get people to use the system and stay with the system to help it solve, uh, to solve problems. So really, the focus, as, as, uh, as, as Jan Willem said, is on the users. So first of all is who are your users? You know, are they bioinformaticians who just want to get the data, extract it, and start running our algorithms and, and all their analytics and programming? <clears throat> are they power users who can do magic with the system, like 
our friend Paul Avilak from, uh, from the keynote yesterday, he's doing amazing things? Or are they more users who this is really to assist them in their workflow? So then the question is, how do you embed or how do you make Transmart part of their workflow? And there's several, there's several experiences there that, that we can talk about. Um, so really, it, the focus is on deriving value from the system. And another kind of guiding principle as well is the, the clarity of the objectives of the project. So you can't be all things to all people and do everything well. So when you're picking a project to start with, you know, like one of your two, two, uh, two pro, uh, POCs, what is the mission of that project? And you got to keep that goal in mind because you're going to run into obstacles and you're going to have to ask yourself, well, is, is the obstacle I run into worth solving somehow so that I can get to my goal? Or if it's not mission oriented or if it's not a high value enough goal, you might run into that obstacle and just exit the system and not come back to it. So we've got a lot of uh, learnings along those lines. So should I pass it on? And yeah, no, maybe, maybe can I ask one follow-up question? So sure. how, how many uh, users do you already oh. support? So how many scientists are really using uh, Transmart from a day-to-day -day basis in the installations that you support? Huh? So. so that's a great question. So we've done about um, 15 to 20 projects on Transmart of varying size and varying complexity. And what we typically find is there's uh, one or two superstars from a, from a user basis who really can formulate these complex translational research questions. Then what we find is there's one or two um, programmer, programmers who want to extract the data and do deep, uh, deep analysis using basically programming languages. And then we find that there's um, a group of users that Sometimes it's hard to onboard, so you have to use various techniques. You have to show how the software can help them do their job. And then another angle to it as well is by embedding Transmart in their workflow or essentially having Transmart be the gateway to the data that they need. So there's no other option. They have to use Transmart. And then you start adoption, see adoption creep up, and then you see the, uh, the, the functionality actually be being uh, evolved to enable those users to, to effectively use the system. Thanks. So, UK, can you? I think you, you have your own mic, huh, don't you? Oh, can you just one? Sir? OK. Yeah, I'm Ike, so I from foundation. But also, uh, my day job is at Imperial College. And also with Jay together, we run the eTrix project. So my deployment experience and uh, really is to do always with the projects we support on eTrix. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, one particular project I think I was uh, have about five years experience now is the UbiPred, right? So. That project was the first adoption of Transmart in, in Europe and uh, in the EU project, and really use it. And this leading to the later, we adopted the Transmart for uh, all our my projects, which is each project development. So I quite agree with uh, Ravine's uh, point about uh, the key is to really demonstrate you can attract values out of the system. But really, the, also, I really agree with uh, the observation when you're talking about the user transmart, you really have a different people, have a different view on it. So I actually have quite a lot of experience on dealing with different views. So in my way is if you're really talking about deployment, talking about uh, uh, the attraction, you come from these three dimensions, right? One is the number of the users, which is, a, in my case, the projects, as well as the pro within the project institutions. And then now you look, look at within institutions, you're talking about the different roles, right? Bioinformaticians are one, principal investigator is the one. 
And uh, the other one is uh, another dimension is the number of the people in each row. And you really play the three, three games. And I think U by Pred uh, is a very interesting example, right? We, when we started to use U um, Transmart in the U by Pred, which is uh, with the help of Eric, when he was still actually in the Youngson, not even in the FDA. And, uh, he, and we work with him together to set up the Transmart to start loading the data. That's such an easy one because I'm the bioinformatician in this project anyway, so I take it, there's no barrier. So we actually enjoyed ourselves, right? So it's good. But the, really, the Transmart get uh, really attraction by the UBAP Predator in the 2010 is really the development of the called knowledge portal. And at that time, I forgot what we, we, we called the what, uh, analytical registry, I think. So that was actually a very interesting experience. So we're developing something around the Transmart to help the uh, investigate, the PI, to register their anal an analytical activities. No. Register how actually they generate the hypothesis, why they generate hypothesis, who actually generate it. And uh, you know, we demonstrated this one in the Amsterdam as well as in the Michigan a uh, couple of years ago, right? So it's called Knowledge Report at the moment. So that's actually the way, very interesting. So this is we're hiding a lot of the complexity of the transmat and I use this thing. This is actually make uh, one person extremely happy, which is the PI of the project, which is Peter, Peter Stead. I think this is a, is a crucial moment because he can actually say, he, um, this guy is quite uh, a little bit of dictator. So they say, you can only publish paper if your hypothesis was registered in the analytical registry. No matter how many people follow him or not, but this command generate a lot of attention. And this was the point of time people pay a lot of attention to it. So that's given me a really a good lesson. So basically, if you really got to this thing work, you have to address the different need of different people. For the PI, why he like this? Because this make him to report to the European Union extremely easy. Because you see every day how many activities happening and who generate hypothesis and who it's, and also make the paper, when you publish a paper, who will be the first author? The order become easy too because your contribution was actually listed there very much. That's not too much to do with transmat. But however, this actually bring you, people immediately realize, register their data. If you register an analytics, right? The first thing you do is you register your data. This make this kind of feeling happens. So that was the 2010, which is a time Transmart get really pushed into the project. And uh, I really do think now that's why the knowledge management. That's if you look carefully, the Etrix not even called the data management. It's called the knowledge management service. So I think it's really the you know, this lesson I learned. I think that when you really build a system, you can really think about it. So from an end user point of view, what's the value to him the most? But also another experience we had to learn is that you're, you're actually, some success is your, your, your worst enemy. So in the period of the U by Pred, I think in the 2011 and 2012, I attended a lot of the meeting. At the time, Anthony was still working with me and he was mainly my representative of the meeting. His job to explain to everyone is not Transmart, what Transmart can do. He explained to people, this is not a Transmart job. I think that's actually quite important because with a lot of clinical scientists, they really want to press the button, you, you, you get a drug or you get a, a therapeutic uh, proposals and you got all the results you want, you can generate your paper from For Nature. That's not going to work. But this is a very interesting, so for example, uh, when we're talking about uh, really generated uh, the uh, hand, handprint, so that was basically multiple biomarker come together to form a really a portfolio of the, really the biomarker um, 
uh, sort of the um, proposal and also the analysis. And in this case, really, what you think about it is transformer should provide the direct result of it. So, yeah. and, and when you look at the current situation in Etrix, eh, so how many projects uh, are you supporting? How many users? I, I leave it to the PI. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we support six already. I, I yeah. thought you were still the PI. Yeah, I can yeah. leave some. Okay, for you. Jay? Six, yeah, six. six. Uh, I'm Jay Bergeron. I am five. Is, is your microphone work? No. Yeah. All right. How's that? Jay Bergeron, Pfizer. I used to be a software developer, and now I do predominantly email. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, I'm responsible for systems for clinical research and precision medicine. Uh, a couple years ago, we had a hunch, and this is my boss, Christoph Brockel, who was part of the foundation, moved on to another role. Really had a hunch that translation. Translational research is going to be important. We're going to have to be dealing with these data sets, but we had absolutely no demand. And we gravitated to Transmart because of Etrix, because of Trait, because of what we saw was, was the real potential for a community. Uh, one of the first things we did, because we had no demand, was to put in genome-wide association studies, which there was an interest in. And we could have built this separately, but what we decided to do is essentially artificially create demand for, for Transmart. And uh, basically, we've done that. And there's a number of people who use that on a day-to-day -day basis. But an interesting thing happened. So we use recombinant. So I think first, first and foremost, if you're struggling with deploying this application, you have an entire community that can help you. And I think one of the most important things that you can do is, is get help. And that's what we did. So within a week, we had instances up and running. Within two months, we had data sets in and we're starting on a development program, and you can do that. So I've talked to people who are sitting here for like six months trying to get Transmart to work. Well, that really shouldn't happen. And we did this with Etrix, and actually it's a disappointment in Etrix. There's gotta be something that, it's a community, right? There's gotta be something you can barter, whether it's cash or something else to, to get in and get in quickly. Uh, we currently have about, so the first year, we had a really nice success story that was COPD. Again, no demand, but when we put out this application, someone came to me and said, I got 50 spreadsheets. It's taken me an hour to do anything with them, or, or a day to do anything with them. Put them all in Transmart with the help of Recombinant, and all of a sudden, he can get queries back on these data sets, generate hypothesis in a couple minutes. And he goes running around the company touting Transmart. The next year, we had our neurosciences people, and we had ADNI and PPMI and track TBI. And our neuroscience person went around the company touting Transmart. And this year, we've spent so much time trying to integrate 1.2 and make that available. The thing that I'm really concerned about, both internally, and I think to some extent with, with I think internally with Etrix, and maybe it also resonates with other in the others in the foundation, and I think one of the issues of trying to make this work is if you're spending, when you spend all your time accumulating and compiling branches together, you're losing that contact with your customer. Mm. And I think internally, we, we've lost a little bit of that contact with our customer. As an IT guy, that's, that's, that's really concerning to me. I think it's happened in Etrix as well. And it's something that this 1.2 on, my job, my goal, is to make sure that to refresh and rebuild those relationships with customers and really under, and really chart the next step for what Transmart can be. Mm. And I think that's really important, it's something that we have to consider, I think, as a community when we, when we do this, these, these types of grand development and branch integrations. So and I'll leave it there. Yeah, so, um, yeah, but, yeah, please. Yeah, I really appreciate that comment quite a bit. We've had the same kind of issue here, I think, because, you know, we want to use it more than just develop it. And uh, so, I, you know, this is kind of to you guys at Etrix, and I know Michael's here as well, uh, and others. Uh, you know, now that, you know, and I think this is consistent with your philosophy to a certain degree, UK, and, you know, which is now that we have one. So I want, just want to translate what I heard a little bit. Now that we have 1.2, let's really use it, you know, and, and get it out there and focus. And, uh, you know, with, with the partners, whether it's Track TBI or whoever, that really care and want to use it and demonstrate its use. I mean, you know, 
Isn't that the opportunity with Etrix now that you have the platform? Don't you have a number of the Luxembourg guys are a number of driving problems that you're going to put up on the platform and demonstrate its use? I mean, could you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, because yeah. I think that's a path to sustainability, and I think CPMM Trade's got that. And uh, we want to have that in the U.S. I mean, Harvard's got them with Corey and some others. Yeah, for each X, I, I, I have a few my view and then Jay can add on. Um, there are a couple of, uh, when we get, when we spend a lot of the time as well as the resource to bring this 1.2 with a strong belief from each point of view. So in order to have a, scalable user base, and in order to make a lot of projects use it, you must make the software platform solid. So that is the really the first. But now, I think as Jay said, we need to really now to use it. So that's why from the Etrix point of view, uh, you know, we will have our meeting just in next week. We'll be in Berlin to talking about really the Etrix resource. And a lot of efforts my personal opinion will be really push into really support projects. And not in the support of the numbers, but also support deep, right? We have Uncle Chuck and we have Abbey Risk and many projects is now in hand, okay? So one thing which, which is actually very, very important for us is really looking around a couple issues. Data standard, you know, pre transmart work, I usually call it. How to put data in ready, so then we can really automate as much as we can the curation process. So that's actually the bottleneck. You put the number, put the data into the system. How to make the more smart. So for this one, we're developing, we presented, Florian presented yesterday, this uh, study repository. So you're staging data, right? So this also comes with my previous view, is uh, you need to tell people the limitation between the transmart Transmart data warehouse. By definition, data warehouse is not a transactional database. You don't load in data every day. So that you, you just stage it. That, that we're doing, that's for preparation of the scale up. The second one we will do, as I said, you need to make a PI happy. So we were staging the system by build this knowledge portal concept in from Transmart. So what we are doing for Etrix is really want to see how we be cleverly make the use of the transmart become easy. And we can scale, I mean, each is a small project. So we really can compare with the project we are support, but how we make this one more smart. Okay, let me say this. Because we, we just had a conversation about open source. I am not an open source aficionado. Right? I am, my job is to deploy technology in a way that makes sense for the, for the company that I work for. And it ultimately comes down to some kind of economic efficiency. And what I said is I am never going back to Pfizer, to my management, and say, we're going, we want to do Transmart because it is open source and because there is some socio-psychological socio value to it. I'm going to go back to my company because there is an absolute economic efficiency to this. Mm -hmm. And I think the content play is one of those, mm -hmm. right? If it takes us God knows how much, how much time and money to do ad well, imagine if someone, we're happy to do that. And if someone else does Cam D for us, that's, that's the type of efficiency that we need. And that's the type of efficiency that can come out of this community. I think for Etrix, the content play is, is something that's really valuable. I would love to see Etrix be that. Here's the Etrix public server that is a, a core repository for European public scientific content curated, available to everyone. What a great transformative thing that Etrix can do. And Etrix has to be transformative. Yeah. When I go back to work, I need to do operational things on behalf of my customers. But Etrix has to be transformative. If all we do and if all we value ourselves is the number of projects that use Transmart on, you know, by Etrix, then I think fundamentally at the end of five years, regardless of what that number is, we've failed. Because we've failed to be transformative. Because commercial organizations can do that. Mm. So that's one. I would like to see, let's talk about the, the reason why I asked about barriers, right? Think of, a, think of this, the standard business ecosystem. I hate the word ecosystem. When everyone says ecosystem in a business context, I say, what's your currency in that ecosystem, right? What's that, what's that ecologic energy 
that's flowing between the, the parts and, and wait to see if someone can answer that. And if they don't, I know that they're, they're, not, they're not serious about the, about the metaphor. So what I think would be is really interesting to watch, if you look at the, the classic where you have anchors, right, the uh, keystones, right, the, the great company, the, fi the pharma used to be like this, all right, you got the Pfizer and all these companies kind of stood around it. And now we're breaking it up and everything's smaller. I would love to understand if the value of that expanded, smaller node ecosystem can be valued greater than the classical anchored ecosystem. And I think that would be a great thing to look at. And if that's the case, then it opens up communities like this and the value of communities like this. And I believe that for Transmar. I'm not sure I believe it for every open source community, but I believe that for Transmar. And honestly, for the last two years, I'm willing, I'm willing to stake my job on it. I'm willing to stake my, my reputation on that within the company. Because I think that the efficiencies that we can provide here in things like content, in things like, um, in things like collaborative trans, you know, transfer of data, are something that's absolutely valued to the company that I work for and, and also for our competitors. It makes our, our, it's going to make our industry better. So, thank you.